Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Arthur Demrich, director of the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I'm really delighted to welcome you today to the Innovative, Live, Innovative Lives program featuring Mr. Nathaniel Mathis. This is the first in a series of four programs for spring 2022, all of which will feature inventors and innovators from the DC region. We're hosting this program on Zoom, so be aware of some of the policies associated with Zoom. We do encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A, and we will get to those as soon as we have an opportunity to. Um, I also just want to bring to your attention, you know, we do occasionally have connectivity issues with Zoom. If things stutter, if anything happens, just stick with us. We'll get right back to it as soon as, you know, the Wi-Fi speeds back up. Um, so have a little patience with us. Thank you. Um, as the nation's capital, D.C. tends to be known for regulation, for lawyers, for everything that we think of as the opposite of innovation. But D.C. is actually home to many inventors and innovators who we're going to be featuring this winter and spring. Inventive places, as the Lemelson Center is documented and as it features in its Places of Invention exhibition, and those places feature risk takers. They feature support systems for innovators and opportunities for collaboration and development of ideas that turn into products and services. And this program today is part of our center's core mission to document inventors for the future, even as we aim to educate the public about the importance of invention and innovation and engage with audiences from across the United States and indeed around the world to help them understand how inventors think and work, to bridge and to understand that we too can and should and need to be inventive. Innovators break through what others expect of them, and you're going to see that very much with today's featured speaker. It's not easy. Innovators face the constraints of the materials they work with. They deal with limited financial resources. They struggle with the many failures that actually only sometimes lead to success. And especially if they're inventors of color, they have to manage institutional constraints and unequal treatment. But innovators also get support, sometimes from unusual places and they get the joy of seeing their work change the world. So keep those themes in mind as we go through today's program. We also hope this series helps empower you, the visitors, the attendees, in how you think about and use technology in your lives. We live in this era of very fast technology change, but also a time in which technology can be used to bring about positive changes. And just a minute ago, I mentioned structural barriers and constraints. It is February, and this program is part of the museum's Black History Month programming. Our featured inventor today started in an era of profound segregation, and he himself encountered structural racism throughout his life and his work. It's important to identify and call that out, even as we collectively work to make changes to those systems. The invention and innovation ecosystems are not set apart from the rest of American society or American history. They're part and parcel of it, and bringing about change to that is really a core mission, both of the Lemelson Center, the National Museum of American History, and needs to be part of what all of us do. I'm now pleased to introduce my colleague, Faith Ruffins, curator of African American History and Culture in the Division of Cultural and Community Life in the National Museum of American History, who's gonna be moderating today's program. She has been a historian and curator at the Smithsonian since 1981 with a specialty in ethnic imagery and popular culture, the history of African-American museums, and the collection and preservation of artifacts and stories of the African-American experience. Faith holds degrees from Radcliffe and Harvard in American history and American civilization. Faith, over to you. Hello, and thank you so much for coming. Um, actually, I can't see myself, but I assume I'm on screen. <laughs> Um, uh, it's wonderful to be in one of these Limelson programs because I respect the work of the Limelson Center really tremendously. I think it's added uh, a needed element to the uh, National Museum of American History. And I'm especially happy to be here with Mr. Nathaniel Mathis, who is our featured inventor innovator for today. Mr. Mathis, who is a Washington, D.C. area native, he grew up here and he went to school here um, and uh, uh, became first a barber and then a, which is a traditional um, 
uh, uh, job category for African Americans and others in American society. And one of the interesting things about being a barber is that it's possible to become an entrepreneur as well. And you can own your own business, own your own property. And that has a long history that has now been uh, written about as a, as a, as a, a theme in African American culture, because these were barbers, uh, barber shops, and beauty parlors were places that African Americans could control in a time when they weren't able to control uh, maybe the wider society. But these were important institutions. But he didn't just become a barber. He learned about cosmetology. He became a stylist. Then he became an inventor, innovator, a motivational speaker. I have to say, perhaps most impressive, a seven-time um, <clears throat> participant and completer of the Marine Marathon, which is a big thing in uh, Washington, and a uh, inv game inventor. And we bring him here today because his collection on the history of barbering and cosmetology is in the National Museum of American History's Archive Center. And the objects are in the uh, other parts of the museum and have been there since 1998. So I want to welcome Renaissance man, Mr. Nathaniel Mathis. How are you today, Mr. Mathis? Good, Ms. Ruffin, it's very fine. I'm so excited, I don't know what to do. But I, know, <laughs> <laughs> I know what I gotta do, so here we go. Here we first, go. First thing I wanna do is give thanks to God for being here, giving thanks to a few other people. And I'd like to share those people with you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to you and Mimi Minnick for the, bringing me into the museum about 20 some years ago. And I really appreciate that. Also, I'd like to thank the team that's been working with us to make this day a reality. And it, that's, that's the greatest thing that's happened recently in my life and I love it. <laughs> okay. And um, the question is that I, I've asked myself and I'm sure the audience wants to know, how did I get here? How did you get here? That's, that's yeah. our hot topic for today. <laughs> Well, let's start out where we all start out, which is uh, children. Right. You, you were brought up by your mother and your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, talk to us a little bit about that environment. Okay. I'm going to say what happened on one Sunday. My grandmother used to always listen to gospel music. And she used to sing along. And I'd go in and listen to her. And uh, one day she said, what do you want to be in life? I said, Grandma, I want to be famous. <laughs> I didn't even know what famous meant at that time. I was about 12, you know. So she said, to be famous, you got to help people. You got to help somebody. And I never forgot that. That's what me today, you know, helping people, even with the skating, you know, thing. But after that, I always thought about it. And then my mother said, you have something special. Because I used to think that I could make things happen like a baseball game. I could tell you who's going to win and all that kind of stuff. So I believe that, and it became a part of my life. And she would always say, you have the Mathis magic. Oh, I, the I, Mathis I, magic. And, and, and anytime, I would do something, anytime I would do something, she said, you got it. And that, that meant that I had the Mathis magic. So I remember when I first got my first pair of clippers, she gave me $50 for Christmas. I went up to the uh, five and 10 store, and I looked in the window and I saw these clippers and I started thinking in my mind, I'm thinking like an entrepreneur now, not even realizing it. I said, if I get these clippers, I can make some money. So <laughs> the, haircuts, the haircuts used to be a dollar and a quarter back in those days. So I charged 50 cents and all the kids in the neighborhood knew me just from being around. And then they found out that I was cutting hair and every Saturday my house would be full of, of kids to get the haircut. And one day, while I was working on the back porch and the people sitting in the living room, there's one of these guys that was kind of rough and running from the police and all that kind of stuff. And he came in and sit down. And, and then the police came and said, did you see somebody come, come past here? I said, no, sir, lying like a bird. I said, okay, that's where I, I decided to go to school. And I went to Phelps Vocational High School. And from there, I started helping the teacher teach the class because I was already pretty good at uh, cutting hair. And that's how it really started. 
And now, from there, now, if Phelps Vocational is a school that used to exist uh, in DC, but doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, with a lot of the vocational schools, it's gone out. But that's mm -hmm. unfortunate because the because what they were teaching were things that people could use to support themselves and their families. Exactly. exactly. And that's why that's so important. Mm -hmm. And then also just ideas on how to get customers. Now, I remember when I first got my first customer after I got my Clippers, the boys would play basketball down at the um, Watts Branch Playground. So I went down there and I started telling people that I could cut hair. And my first client was named Carlton Calloway. He's still a friend of mine right now. And uh, I cut his hair, but I cut a big chunk out the back. And I said, oh, I messed up. First thing that he did was look in the mirror and say, this is fine. Gave me my 50 cent and I was on my way and just moved on from there, just doing everything, thinking, 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 thinking on how to uh, make this better. And that's, that's one of the ways that um, really made it work. So I've been doing it ever since, just believing in myself and believing that I can make things happen and they constantly happen. So that's how that happened. That's how that happened. Wow, mm -hmm. that's like, that, 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 you know, childhood, what happens to you as what kind of help vocational and learning barbering, but then you took a slightly different video back on, thank you. You ran a slightly different direction and you can uh, bring up on the video uh, slide four. Because when you graduated, you were interested in being in a singing group. Yes. There we see. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about these photographs. OK, this was a group that I was in called the Stereophonics. And it was my, I was the spokesman of the group. So my idea was to get a group of handsome guys that could sing. And we did that and we got the um, instrumental part and it really worked. But one thing that I had learned, see my grandfather, he worked at the um, Library of Congress and he would give me books like um, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, The Law of Success, um, How to Influence People, um, Win Friends and Influence People by- um, That's a classic, Neil Carnegie. Neil Carnegie, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, Zig Ziglar. And yeah. he, his, his thing with me was to read. And that's how I really got my patents and stuff because no one helped me to do that. I just researched and, and read like he told me and everything that I wanted to do, I did myself. I didn't have you know money to pay a lawyer or somebody to help out. I had to do all these things myself. And even with the singing group, you know, we trained each other how to you know change pitches and sing lead singing and all of that. Now and he was a big help. And, and one other thing I want to tell you about him is that one Sunday, he told me to come go with him. And we went downtown. And he showed me people that were street people, you know, that had slept on the street. And um, I said, well, what, why are they sleeping out here, Granddad? He said, well, they, you know, they went past their understanding of life. And he said, one thing that I want you to remember, this is called the poor house. And you don't never want to go to the poorhouse. And I oh. never forgot that. that. That became a strong part of my life. Uh, don't you know, ever want to go to the poorhouse. That's right. The poorhouse on the, the poor streets. House. Yeah, that's it. And I never forgot that. And I remember the day that he paid his house off. He um, told me to, to hold the envelope and then drop it in the mail. And from that time on, I wanted to be debt free in America. Right. That was right. one of my special things that I wanted to do by the time I got 50 years old. Right. And so then, now look at this photograph, the art, the red, the red, the photograph with you in red, you're at the bottom. Uh-huh. And the one that's black and white, you're over on the uh, right. It's yes. right on my against thing. the wall. Uh-huh. Tell me what you you uh, uh you said once to me that that you wanted to be in the singing group but everybody wasn't as serious as you exactly what yeah. did that mean well that meant to me that i couldn't no longer be with those kind of guys at that particular time because they didn't have the same goals and principles in mind so what i did is i, I started um doing hair and doing different things like we had a, a dance and barber type thing we could and go to was, slide five now yeah <laughs> And I was, I was, you know, doing hair and dancing, and I had a group, 
And that was interesting. And you also you I were dancing a, while you were doing hair. Yes. That okay. was just, I, I just, wish I'd seen that. And matter of fact, Chuck <laughs> Brown was on that show. Chuck Brown. I did Chuck Brown's hair for over 40 years. But I'm just saying, we it's still so many things that happen because of the way you thought, you know. And what I learned is that everybody has genius in them. And I think what happened is like you you kind of look for the genius in somebody else. And it, and it just grows like that because you meet the right kind of people to make things happen. So not saying that I'm a genius or anything like that, but I just, the genius thought. And I would, I would recommend people to look up the word genius and see what it means. And you might see yourself in there. Right. You, you, you are one of the most relentlessly positive people I've ever met, Mr. Mathis. Thank you. Uh, over, over, over time. So this little picture that you got at some kind of a hair convention you went to. Yes. Uh, gives gives people a sense of what the black barbershop was like. Yeah. In the 40s. Well, I don't know about, I don't personally know about the 40s, but mm -hmm. the 50s, 60s, 70s into that. And to some degree, that's still true today. It is. To some it degree. Is. Yeah. Um, at the barbershop, you could go and you could learn a lot, especially young guys, because older guys wanted to share with the younger guys what, you know, what was going on and how you could make things happen. And I even my even the name of my book, one of my customers said, um, I got a name for your book. And I said, what is it? He said, Portrait of a Professional. Right. Wow. Right. You know, and people That's your were, new, newest book. Yeah. That's your yeah. newest I, book. I want to give you, I gave you a copy to put with the you did. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the thing I the thing I um uh want to bring out here is that I remember you talking about being as a, like, sort of like an apprentice to mm -hmm. an older barber who had a shop. Yeah, yeah. But then you eventually get your own shop. Could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Okay, what happened was Tom, he was an older guy. He must have been in his 60s at the time and I must have been in my 20s or whatever. So every time that he would want to go somewhere, he would ask me to handle the shop and the cash register and everything. And he kind of taught me what to do after he was gone. That's uh -huh. how the older guys used to do. So, you know, they always say, you know, you pay attention, you know, you, you really listen to what people are saying. And one, one way that I remember about that, my grandmother said, remember, you have two ears and one mouth. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> See, those are the kind of things that they used to tell you, you know. There he is. Yeah, another one, yes. another one is the old black people used to say these things and they all were kinds of stuff. Yeah, I didn't know what they meant at first, but they mean so much to me now. And 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 when they was talking about taking care of yourself, they say something like, Now you don't want to be sick, broke, and stupid. In other words, you become sick because you did it to yourself, and you become broke because you can't work anymore. And then you, you know, the other part is just just messed up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it keeps your mind thinking, you know, it keeps you on a, on a high, you know. So let's let's bring up slide six and tell us a little bit about how you got your own barbershop and your own beauty center. This is yeah. now you've gone past. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you came up with Nat the Bush Doctor. Okay, that's a good one. What happened was, I got so popular in DC area, people started calling me to come on their radio television show. I, I, I did the Petey Green show, right. I did the Carol Henson Petey. show, yeah. the Carol Randolph show, yeah. all of the all, Max, Max Robinson show, all of those shows. All they of these to local come on. black people on radio and television. And then when Mr. Henson introduced me, he said, ladies and gentlemen, they used to call me Nat the hair doctor. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, we have Nat the bush doctor. And it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> it stuck. I mean, you know, people loved it. Because, see, I had what is called the first hair hospital. That's first right. Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I was the doctor, you know, and people would bring their sick hair to me. And then I had the executive service where I did um, actors and singers and people like that. That's how I met a lot of those people. And, you know, they would send other people to me. And for you know it, they just kept calling me for different things. And the biggest thing that happened after that um, was I got with Soft Sheen and Ultra Sheen. Now, and let, me mention, let me mention this a little bit. 
for mm-hmm. the people because they don't quite exist the same yeah, that's anymore. True, that's true. Uh-huh. Is that um, uh, there were important black hair care companies that yes. were black owned and distributed. Yes. One were the Johnson products and Johnson did Ultra yeah. Sheen, right? That's the Afro Sheen and Ultra Sheen. Mm-hmm. Ultra Sheen and a- a- Ultra Sheen came first and mm-hmm. then Afro Sheen after they get the Afros. And I was the Afro Sheen specialist. Right. And those mm-hmm. used to be available in, in the uh, 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 drug stores and yeah. uh, grocery stores around D.C. Mm-hmm. And they were well known. That's what a lot of Black people, they were advertised in Ebony and Jet um and a lot of people knew these were black owned firms yeah uh they don't exist in the same way anymore right but uh that was very important when you were you were uh developing your business and see salt sheen sent me all over the world i was in africa london paris um egypt i mean they sent me everywhere to introduce the products to the people over there and you know i stayed gone on the weekends pretty most of the time doing hair away, showing people how to use their products. And I got so popular, they featured me in all of the hair magazines and, and everything. And it's just, it just blew up, you know, unbelievable. Now, um, I think uh, from my list uh, is slide seven, the patent. Okay, all right, that's slide seven. See, that's the okay. Afro Sheen special. See that can in my hand? Yeah. That's yeah. Afro Sheen. So this and is was, like a, 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 a promotional a shot. Yeah, to let and people these know. these all come from the collection. Oh, yeah. The, that's in the Smithsonian mm-hmm. at the Museum of American History. Yeah. So you can see down here, for those of you who are watching, it says Nathaniel Mazza's collection of barbering and beauty culture. That's, that's what's at. And you can come visit it uh, when the Archive Center is open. It may not be fully open today due to COVID. But uh, it is open in general and will one day be open as, as much as it used to be. Used to be. So, yes, you, you, you traveled around the world for yeah. Afro Sheen and Ultra Sheen, but that wasn't enough. You, uh, let's go up to slide nine because that shows us. Uh, um, oh, slide yeah. nine shows us. Um, oh, uh, go back. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. The, that's now the, here we have your first patent mm-hmm. for this barber stylist tool organizer. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about how you came up with this idea and what motivated you to apply for a patent. Okay, this is how I was so motivated. It's like one time I was looking for a pair of shears, and I hit, I did my chest like this, like I was looking for. It. And I, the idea came like, bam! The, you see the the, um, the holders on the front? Yes. With the shears in it? That's how I got the idea of the shears in a vest. I had never seen it. It was never anything like that. So I said, hey, I'm going to do this. So I drew the um, patent, got the ideas, and I did a lot of research on how to, how to do patent drawings and all kind of so stuff. You went to the Library of Congress or you just went to libraries and you learned yes. how yes. to the libraries. The, my grandfather, remember, he worked at the Library of Congress. I know, but so, you never oh, told yeah. me that before. That's fascinating. Oh, yeah. He was the one that really, I mean, he just told me things to do and, and things that possibly would happen if you do that. So, you know, I just did what he said and, and just started looking and researching and before I know it I had I had a patent. Well you're you're you like many people my our ages are products mm-hmm. of this older generation. Mm-hmm. They didn't have as many opportunities. And so our generations were able to maybe um go a little bit further because mm-hmm. there are a few more opportunities than they had. But they had wisdom. Mm-hmm. That's that what it could, was that they could bring. That's what the magic is. Yes. Wisdom. You know, that's what the magic is. And my mother, every time I was going to do a show or something, she said, you got it. And that means you got the math is magic. So don't worry about a thing. Just do your thing. You become what you think about most. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So um, if we go to 10, uh, slide uh, 10, I think. Okay. This is your model. Yeah. Okay, we can go to the next slide. 
Okay. This is Chuck Brown. Mm -hmm. Those of you in the audience who may or may not recognize Chuck Brown, uh, who is the, some people call him the father of Go-Go. Godfather of Go-Go. Right. It's a little easier to see him on the slide on your right with Nat, mm -hmm. but he's standing here at, uh, what is that? It's 7th and New, that's, isn't it? No, they, they named the street after him. Yes, they did. And, and that's, that's what we're street standing street. under the sign. You're standing under the sign. I'm trying to think where this is in D.C. Isn't that's the 7th and, 7th and uh, Florida Avenue. 7th and Florida Avenue in mm -hmm. uh, Northwest. Yes. Uh, it's Chuck Brown Way. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Bob, you, you, you did hair for a lot of people. Oh, uh, but goodness. you didn't just do hair because now we're going to move to slide. It must be slide uh, 12. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the Wheel of Life game. Okay. The Wheel of Life game, the way that came to me, I had done so many different things in so many articles and uh, TV shows, radio shows, and all that stuff. And one guy said, you know what? You got a book in you. And that's how the book came about also. But he said, you have uh, um, a way of, of doing things that if you could explain it to people, then somebody else could do it. And it's in my book, it's in, the, in how to do it and everything. But the whole idea was that if you can get a person to get focused on various things, like your family, your mental self, your um, uh, social self, um, financial, all of these different things, you can, you can do it and you can make this thing something that you do every day. That's what I learned. If you do something every day, just like my art now, I do something, I draw or paint every day. And then the, the, um, if you notice on the right with the paint brushes in, that's where I would put my paint brushes that I was working with. And then on the left, you see the um, one for bobbing and so you can also use screwdrivers or whatever you need for this to make it easy to get to right away and you can see one of my first uh, art studios in the middle and uh, the wheel of life keeps you focused on what you're wheel doing of life keeps you focused uh as you if it's but talk, tell us about it started out as a game mm -hmm. and it became a motivational um uh lecture yeah. So talk see, a little bit about that transition. This right here is a bookmark. And now, it's the that's Wheel a bookmark. Life. Now, yeah, the game, a copy of the game is in the museum's collection. Yes, I got a picture of it right here. Right here. This is, this is the game. And those little dots had value to them. So each thing that you focused on every day, you would put one of those stones on it, and you would do everything that you had to do that day. Okay, and I noticed someone mentioned, or one of y'all mentioned that, um, what am I, what am I going to do next? What I decided to do next is take my Wheel of Life game and put it on a phone or iPad like that, and you can study the game right, take it with you wherever you go. Right. Mm -hmm. So it started out like a board game, and it right. ended up on the on the phone. All the things that we're doing electronically now, you can do it on the phone. Right. Because when you came up with the game, which was when what? The 1990s? Yeah, uh, I think it was in the 80s, I believe. Maybe in the but, 80s. But I didn't bring that part out, you know. I, right. just, I was working on the, um, the game itself and, and the seminar. I turned the game into a seminar. And I call it the dynamics of feeling good about yourself. And it taught yes. people how to feel good about themselves and do things that they can make things happen. Most people are afraid to be alone, but you know, being an only child, that's all I had time. So I took that time and, and called it time management. And whatever I wanted to do, I would get focused on it. I call it laser focus. And you do it. And the same thing with my art now. You know, people say, wow, you can really draw. You can do. And that's because I do something like that every day. And the average person won't do that. You know, they just, they, they'll say something and say, oh, I could do whatever, but they don't. And I never understood that because those little things my grandmother and grandfather and mother told me, I would always think about the things that I could do to really make something happen. And this is one thing I wrote down that I wanted to mention. If you want to get focused, you got to get serious. You got to get smart. You got to get going. You got to get excited. And you got to live a good lifestyle. 
And if you do that, these things will pop. It's just how it is. You know, you sometimes you can figure things out in your own mind that works. And it could, it could work for people, just like when I teach roller skating. You know, the average person look down all the time at their feet. I say, why are you looking at your feet? I said, when your mother or father drive their car, they don't look down at the feet. <laughs> <laughs> so just little things. That's what I learned too. The little things make big things happen. That's very, that's very interesting. Little things make big things happen. Well, mm -hmm. well tell us, why did you decide to do uh, marathons? Well, that was part of my health program. You know, I never wanted to be sick, broken, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't do something for your health now, you're going to pay later. That's how yeah. it is. You're going to pay later. You know, you're eating the wrong foods. That's going to turn into something else. You know, so my study with the books and my grandfather and all, I just, you know, believe that stuff. And your belief is what makes things happen. Now, you've mentioned this before. This is a tremendous aspect mm -hmm. of, of, of your persona. It's the belief in self. Yes. And the positive belief in self. Mm -hmm. which you attribute to having uh, the experience of being with your mother and your grandparents. Mm -hmm. How do you, when you talk to other people, how, how do you get, maybe they didn't have the extraordinary grandmother and grandmother, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mother. So how do you get them to think about this? Well, the first thing I say is document everything. Document everything. And I learned that some time ago. You know, it's like, whatever you have, just put it over here in a little box. I went the other day to look for some things. I couldn't believe all of the things that I had just for that belief alone. And those things to help you in whatever you're trying to do. You know, I, I um got my patent and all of that before I graduated from, from uh, college. Right. And, and when I went to college, you know, that was part of my background that they could use in my points, you know? So all of that makes a difference. You know, you just gotta get, you gotta get serious. You gotta get smart. You gotta get going. You gotta live a good lifestyle and you gotta get excited. And those are the little things that make, see a little shot is a, is a big shot that kept on shooting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, tell me, where where do you come up with your best ideas? Well, when I'm walking, uh, when I'm when I meditate, and from different people, you know, different people have ideas that they don't even realize is valuable ideas. They just talk, you know. But I learned if you listen, you get more out of it. So all my ears are already trained to, to get stuff that people wouldn't even think of because I've been doing it so long. Well, I, I realize you probably need to bring slide up, slide 13 back up, a uh, slide 11, excuse me, because I forgot to mention his second pat. Oh, that's it. That, okay, this is it. Yeah. See, these two... The, the wooden one and the more um, that's plastic uh, plastic one mm -hmm. uh, like are are these he got his second patent in 2019 mm -hmm. for these adapted they started out looked like almost like uh, CD players mm -hmm. uh, roll, roll turning around CD play, CD mm -hmm. holders mm -hmm. but then you drilled holes in them. So that, for example, with your painting studio, which is what we're seeing up here to the left, mm -hmm. your painting studio, you can have the paints um, be there and be available, but not be interacting with each other. Right. Um, not not being um, not not they're 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 the sub the colors are still separate. So mm -hmm. you can bring them back to the canvas, and they'll be the same. That's the also, early one. Also, the later you one those, is the wooden one. Yeah, you can pull the drawers out too. The guy said I had three patterns in one. First is the drawers. You can pull them out and put them up or put them down. And then you can turn it. That's another one. And then you got your um, pattern on the top with, where you put your whatever, screwdrivers, scissors, whatever, whatever you work with that you want right there available for you. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a very uh, that's very interesting.
because it shows that while you're working, you're thinking about innovating. Yes. All Just the time. like with the apron. Yes. You were working and you thought about innovating. Now, mm -hmm. I want to say to the audience of whom there are almost 100 people uh, here now, if you have questions, you should put it in the chat or the Q&A. Okay. Thank you. All right. So please put your questions in. Uh, I'm going to go through some more chat uh, with Mr. Mathis, and then I'm going to go to the questions uh, from the audience. What do you do, Mr. Mathis, when you get stuck on a problem? Well, even in my art, I stop and go for a walk or just get away from it for a while. And before you know it, you'll come up with the answer. I always say, if you ask yourself quality questions, you will get quality answers if your mind is programmed in that direction. So I, I stop what I'm doing and then I, I'm, I go away from it for a while and then I come back and my mind is fresh for new ideas that might um, manifest itself. So how do, you, how do you know it's a quality question though? Well, the quality question is if I wanna know something, <laughs> and I, well, I need an answer. That's a quality question. <laughs> hey, so any question could be a quality question. That's right. It, 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 whatever it means to you. Whatever it means to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about collaboration. That's a question, but it seems like you've done a lot of your work alone. Yeah. And, and you talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, there are good things about being alone because you have control total you control you but but the maybe problematic things is that you don't get any help yes. so if you could talk about that a little bit yes what happens is i guess if you program it's a certain way that you program your subconscious mind and i learned all these things from the uh, dale carnegie and all those people um zig ziglar um just everybody and these things that that you want to know you will you'll get it it'll come to you but, but you got to believe it. You got to believe it. Just like- um, You have to believe in yourself. You do. You have to believe and in you what you have to you're believe doing. that you're in your own creativity? Yes. Yes. And you've always had that belief. That's what it I seems have. like. And it happens, you know? It's like all of these things, I, I never went to a lawyer or anything. I just researched it myself and answered the questions and, and did what it said. And next thing I know, I had a patent. And I, I had a trademark. I got a trademark like that. Um, yes, for the game. Yeah. And um, no, um, well, trademark is for Nat the Bush Doctor. Yeah, that's it. And that's the copyright is for the game. So you yes. have all of those mm -hmm. uh, in place. Yes. Um, well, uh, the thing, though, is suppose you're a person who doesn't have all of these um, internal motivations yeah do, do you have any or do you just think that the inventing the desire to invent is internal and you can't yes that is, that is. they have to have it internally you have to have that part um and what i always ask myself for a quality question is what do you want if you can answer that question, you don't, it's not a rush question. It's something that you last until you get the, the answer. You know, what do you want? And then once you get the answer, then you say, why do you want it? And if you can answer that question, you leading yourself to making it happen. And I, uh -huh. I, always, I always relate to it like when you were young and you didn't have a car right. and you decided that you wanted a red car. Everywhere you look is a red car. You know, yeah. and before you know it, you got that red car riding and everybody got it, but they don't use it like to make things happen. I always call it manifesting. You manifest okay. things with your mind. You become what you think about most. Uh -huh. And once you can get in touch with that, but if you got a lot of negative people around you and you say one thing, they saying something else and, you know, you get confused. You don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. So you got to be by yourself for a while to find out who you are, what you are, and where you're going in life, and what do you want. Mm -hmm. And once you ask yourself those quality questions, then you're going to get quality answers that's going to make things happen. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. That is definitely a, um, a, a trait that you talk about all the time. 
<laughs> in our numerous conversations. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about risk taking and failure? Oh, yeah. Sometimes well, failure I give you a good example. I, I give you a good example. When I was okay. applying for my patent and all of that, I you didn't know the how first to patent. Yeah, the all of them, really. All of because you don't know how you're gonna do it, but the how will come. The man that knows how will always have a job, but the man that knows why will always be that man's boss or supervisor. Yes, that's another one of those. <laughs> so you got to know the why, you know, and once you know the why, it's all about programming. You know, that's how we learn. You go to school and you program your mind to get this, this the same thing, but you can do it yourself. I call it school without walls. You know, yes. you get all this information. If you don't put any money in the bank, you're not getting none out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't put the information in and it won't come out when you need it. Well, we've got a, a few really interesting questions. Let me ask you this one. Okay. Who are other inventors? This is from uh, Yolanda. Who are other inventors that inspire you or you think will inspire others? Um, what's that guy's name? Famous Amos, he, he invented the cookie. I think that's how we met. That's how we met. Yes, that's I went came to see Famous Amos because somebody told me he was there, and you and, and Mimi was there, and I gave y'all cards. Yes, and, Famous and then Amos. I got that call, that unbelievable call from y'all. <laughs> <laughs> twenty Famous. years ago, twenty two years ago. Famous Amos, just to uh, let people who might be listening know, who might be younger. Mm -hmm was an African-American man who invented a type of chocolate chip cookie. Mm -hmm. And chocolate chip cookies were very, very big in the 80s. Yeah. I first encountered Famous Amos, who, who invented the cookie in and around Los Angeles when I worked at Stanford before I came to the Smithsonian. And he and another lady we won't mention also had a chocolate cookie mm -hmm. uh, franchise. But Famous Amos uh, became famous, Amos. Uh, and his cookies, which had been con consumed by celebrities, eventually were marketed all over the world. And there mm -hmm. is indeed a famous Amos collection in the Archive Center of the National Museum of American History, along with the Mathis collection. So we must have had a public program celebrating Mr. Amos. Mm -hmm. And you must have come to the public program. Yeah, I did. And gave, gave us a card. And then we thought, well, who is he? Mm -hmm. We need to investigate him. Mm -hmm. So what particularly do you like about Famous Amos? Because he's an innovator, uh, but also an entrepreneur. Now, I don't think he controls the company any longer. Right. But uh, he did start the company. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he was, he was just somebody, he was a Black man, and he was doing things that I wanted to do. So that's where that word genius comes from. Uh -huh. You know, that, that form of genius that people have. I have clients that's been with me over 50 years. And I talked to one today, hey, Jock, what's up, buddy? But I'm just saying, you know, people, a lot of people that I talk to, they, had, they got the genius in them. But you know how to know how to realize you got the genius too, Faith. I'm just saying, you know, Paul, y'all got the genius. But, you know, you got to recognize it. And you gotta, you know, communicate on that level, whatever. But I'm just saying, a lot of people got it and don't even know they had. That's why yes. I say, but yes. if you get a chance, look up genius and see do you fit in the category. Well, yes, I don't know if I'm a genius, but I've been working hard on oh, my <laughs> African American history things. Yes, so indeed. there you go. Let's. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question here from Andrew. Is right. there any innovation of yours that met with opposition? And for whatever reason, and how so? No, I had everything that I had was so original that nobody even thought of it. You know, so I never had any problems with um, competition or anything like that. I don't even believe in competition in business for me because I'm doing mine a, a special way, you know. So, and it's always worked for me. What do you mean by no competition? You I mean, not... like, like a beauty shop. I remember a long time ago, there was a couple of beauty shops that I think they were competing with me and all of that. But I just kept on doing what I was doing because most either they were a beautician or they were a barber. And I was a barber stylist. 
So I call myself a person that was different from a cosmetologist or different from a barber. And also I had other outside ventures like, you know, the, the apron and all those kind of things. So it kept yeah. me far away from competition. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, another question from John. How long did you operate your shop and did you have employees? Now, I know well, in uh, many barbershops, they have uh, people who are rent chairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you, why don't you describe what, how your shop operated? Okay. And you well, had more had, than one shop, right? Yeah, yeah. I had shops and, and operated like a shop, but I gave people uh, a different um, percentage or something like that at the time. And um, another thing too, is that I focused on doing things totally different. And um, even the barbers, we dressed differently. Uh, we looked different. We had our shop fixed in such a way. But what I did when I decided, just like I decided to get out the singing group, I decided to be the doctor. And what I did was the um, dentist, a dentist works by himself with one lady. <laughs> and yeah, in the old long. days, <laughs> yes. So that's where I got that concept from because, oh. you know, many people, and, and like you were saying, competition. I was doing so much and people kind of got jealous of me and all of that kind of stuff. So I said, I know how to stop that. So I just had a one sheer shop with me and okay. just like a dentist. And, and it worked, you know, but that that first got all these people in there. I was making more money than all of them, you know what I mean? Because of my notoriety and everything. So, you know, I just was by myself. I call it the boy next door. Oh, you know, you wouldn't, even know, you wouldn't even know that um, the things that I was doing at the time was unbelievable. I'd go to London and do a big show, come back home and, you know, people don't even know what you just went through. Right. And I've been doing that all my life. Uh, well, we have an anonymous person who uh, she the, the person might have missed the beginning, but that that person is asking, um, what are your greatest inspirations growing up as youth? Now you talked about your grandmother and your grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, are there any particular circumstances within your neighborhood, community, or school that were um, inspirational? Well, I think in school, I, I was chosen to be. Uh, the head barber's helper. I see. Show other people that was coming, just like I'm doing now with skating. Right. You know what I mean? The group I have is people that can skate, but they need to know how to skate better. And that's that's what my, my job, I think, is to help people do better at what they're doing. Now, did and you change, change their mentality to uh, a greater way of thinking? Right. Right. Now, did you start skating as a young person or have yes. you always skated? Oh, always skated. I had the skates with this key around your neck and you <laughs> take them up on your shoes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I remember that too, boy. That was me. I loved it. That was uh, so you kept that all up through the marathoning and the yoga practice. And yeah, the now, the yoga, skating. that was something that really straightened me out when I, when I started. I had a yoga center. Now, when did you when did you discover uh, yoga? Uh, I don't know. Some kind of way that like I always do. I get find some talk to somebody and they talk me, tell me all about it. And I said, let me try this. And that really broadened my insight on things because I did a lot of meditation, you know, just sitting still and relaxing and you know, listening to positive music, all that boogie music and all that, you know, cut that out. And another thing I did. I stopped watching TV for a month. You know, just stop watching TV because see, your mind is cluttered with a lot of foolishness a lot of times, and you don't even realize it. Garbage in and garbage out. So in garbage out. That's it. That's it. So you got you got to be you got to be willing to change. Change right. is the thing, and then apply your knowledge. See, applied knowledge is what makes things work. You can have the knowledge, and you can get what I call over processed too much information, information overload. So you gotta know how to apply your information to work for what you're doing and keep your mind focused on that. And the one key thing that I do now is in art that makes you do that. Right. You know, you know your colors, you know what you're supposed to do and you learn these things, the basics. And once you learn the basics and learning how to think and, and focus yourself, then it comes right back when you need it. 
That's interesting. That's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, Bibiana asks, what was one of the most difficult obstacles? Um, uh, wait a minute. It went, it went up. What are the most difficult obstacles or challenges you faced and how did you overcome it? Okay, like I said, one of the things was um, applying for a patent, applying for all of these things that I have. I just believed that trademark. I could do it. Yeah, I believed that I could do it. I never said I, I can't do this. You know, and I, even in my skating, I tell people, don't say you can't. You can do anything you believe you can do. It's all up to you. Ain't nobody gonna ride in on a white horse and say, get on, let's go. <laughs> okay, it's over, you know what I mean, for men and women. So it's up to you to focus on what you want to be, what you want to have, and what you want to do. Right. Well, now here's a different question from D. Mm -hmm. D asks, um, uh, when, why, when did you go to college and why did you want to get a college degree? Because I believe that I should have one. <laughs> I dropped out of school in the 12th grade. So I had to get my GED. I had to, you know, I did that. Then I had to get my um, AA degree. So I just went to school at night. I wasn't going to quit until I got the li license. And what made me motivated about that, you know, the song that goes, dun, 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 dun. I had to hear that song. <laughs> that was my motivation. You should have saw me when I heard that song, because that's what I was doing. I said, I, I got to hear that song. Well, were any of your relatives, your mother or... Or, whoops, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. is Paul okay. saying something? Yeah, he was saying, how, how many years did it take me to oh. get a college degree? So I took about, I say about about three or four years, you know. But so I you just at I, night and, and, you know, when your work was over. Yes. And I just, I was determined I wasn't going to quit. I don't have quit in me. You know, <laughs> I'm going to do it until the wheels fall off, you know. How many years was it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, what happened was I dropped out of school when I was in my uh, 20s or 18 or something like that. And then I started doing all these things. And, you know, my notoriety got real big, but I still right. wanted the college degree. So I just decided that I was going to not, um, not quit. And that's, that's what happened. And, you know, it just happened. They did big stories on me that because I had, you know, doing big stories all the time when I graduated. And then after that, they wanted me to teach at the college. So right. I, I taught at the college that. for 17 years. You know, and you, and you taught courses on motivation. Yeah. But also on how to have a better uh, barber. Uh, hair stylist. Hair uh -huh. Prince uh -huh. George's Community College, which is where yeah. you get to college. Mm -hmm. um, has classes to this day mm -hmm. on barbering and cosmetology that you can take in order to pass the licensing exams. Mm -hmm. So Monica asks, what is your favorite memory of cutting hair do your, during your career? Um, I guess some of the famous people um, like Alex Haley, James Brown, uh, just a number of, of famous people, the staple singers. Um, Mavis Staples and her dad Pops, uh, just so many people. Just they start coming, and you know, people would tell them about me. And then I did what is called executive service. The executive service was important people. I go to their office, like Max Robinson, um, Jim Vance, all those guys like that. I, I go to their office and cut their hair. And that was now amazing. he's referring to um, former anchors. Max Robinson uh, has been gone a long time. But uh, Jim Vance just died in the last three or four years. He was on mm -hmm. Channel 4. Yeah. I can't remember what channel Max Robinson was on. I think it was nine, I believe. I think it was nine. Yeah. There, there were some of the early Black anchors on uh, news uh, programs mm -hmm. in uh, the D.C. area. Yeah. Um, Carol now, Randolph. Oh, yes. Go on. Yeah. I did her show. Petey Green. Right. I did his hair. Um, just everybody, I mean, all of the important people, I guess. It's just, they, they knew about me and, and, and they made me popular by knowing them. Well, Tanya asks, when is the last time you've done someone's hair? Yesterday. Yes, that's <laughs> what I thought, yes. <laughs> uh, you can bring up slide number uh, 11 or maybe slide 12. 
that shows uh, Nat in his uh, uh, home uh, scenario. Okay, that must be like 12. That's the art studio. Oh, there there you are. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, this Got my is, painting overalls on too. <laughs> yes, he has his painting overalls on. And mm -hmm. you see up here in the corner uh, on your right, you see a frame, it's hard to see, a frame the of, of the apron that's mm -hmm. in the museum's collection. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you can see here, he has a whole, this is in his basement of its own. He has a whole scenario uh, to, cut, to cut hair. Mm -hmm. Then an, another anonymous person asked, did you ever cut or style women's hair? Oh, yes. Yes, remember, I'm a barber stylist. I do it all. But, we, you know, the new, the new styles that people are wearing now with the flat irons and all of that, I kind of stay away from that. I could do it, but I'd rather not. So I just stick with, um, you know, basic haircuts, relaxers, colors, and things like that. Um, we, that works for me. we don't have a slide of it here, but there's another studio behind this one in your home that yes. looks like a beauty parlor. Yeah. With the hair dryers and the mm -hmm. and everything like that. So he does men's hair and women's hair. Mm -hmm. And that is fascinating. because uh, yeah. very few people do do both. Mm -hmm. um, we have a we have another question from Carrie who says. As you look back, were there things you did as a child that later helped you cultivate your invention mindset? Yes. Now, we've and, talked about your grandparents, but mm -hmm. any other things you want to add? Just being alone and having time to think, you know, uh, without any disturbance. And a lot of people have, you know, maybe kids running around or they have a person that always trying to talk to them when they when they're trying to think and stuff like that. I think that's one of the biggest things of um, being an only child. You get a lot of time to yourself, and you know if you use your time wisely, then things usually work itself out because you're using your time like you're supposed to. Yes. Now, uh, Marlene asks, where are you teaching roller skating? On uh, the Lanham Skating Rink in Lanham, Maryland. And, and that's on um, uh, Tuesday from 6.30 to 7.30 and on Saturday from 12 to 1. Okay. And now uh, one of the things you've taken up in recent years is painting. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Because you're relentlessly creative, Mr. Mr. Mathis. You, you, when it, it, no one, there's no time to rest. Mm -hmm. There's always a time to be doing something creative That's with it. you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so how that started, um, I was working at a place called PSI, and we used to give the, well, we give the co um, cosmetology and barbering exam, and they wanted something that everybody could do together. So I thought about it, and I said, you know, if we put some puzzles together, and just everybody, every time you walk past the table, you put a piece on. And that caught on. And then I said, well, those of you that might paint, we'll do paint by the numbers. So that fascinated me there. And I did a few of those. Next thing I know, I said, I'm going to class for this. I love it. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm painting all kinds of stuff, selling my work and everything. So that's, that's exciting to me, something that I can do. And I can see the progress in it. You know, you, you start drawing a painting and you see you was like this a month ago and then another month you like you better than you was. So I always call it better your best. Uh-huh. We have a lot better. of little yeah. slogans you use. Do you say yeah. those in your mind to yourself? Well, what happened was I got a bunch of them. Let me, let me read a couple for you. All that we are is the result of what we thought. Intelligence is only 10% of your memory. You don't know anything you don't remember. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. Another one is document everything. Yes. <laughs> uh, dream big. Well, with you, so you, it, the, the painting hobby or is something you've taken up a little bit later in life, like yeah. in the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, so one anonymous person says, do you sell your paintings? Yes. 
Because yes, you're always an entrepreneur. So yes, you're That's it. You, you're always selling. Now, mm -hmm. uh, an, uh, another another quet uh, person asked Dave. Mr. David asked, "How did you come up with the Afro blowout or method that was so popular in the '70s for the beautiful hairstyles that you did?" Well, that was really good. See, they had what you call a chemical blowout and a heat blowout. So, I used to do press and curls. That's like with the straightening comb and all of that. And I found that you could straighten hair with, with heat, just blowing it the hottest your um, blow drive will blow with a comb and you push it and that hair will straighten out. Once it's straightened out, then you can cut it in the design that you want and you spray a little water on it and it'll go back down and you'll have a nice haircut. But the average person don't do that. They just cut over the top of the hair and, and they're cutting hair that don't need to be cut off. Right. Mm-hmm. So that made, you know, I always used to, I used to always like to do people that worked in a bank or a store. So people would say, girl, who did your hair? You know, and that would get me more clients all the time. And it still works. Because if you learn how to do the basics on anything and you do it well, people are gonna come to you because nobody's doing it like that. The doctor. Well, that's that's quite fascinating, quite fascinating. Now, Amanda asked, did you have a new hobby? But we talked a little bit about that mm -hmm. um, because your new hobby, your new goal has to do with painting. Yes. Uh, and of course you have the roller skating, which you weren't, weren't doing all along. I guess mm -hmm. it might be, um, um, I, I can't say, cause I've never run it, but I imagine the Marine Marathon might be a little too strenuous today. <laughs> although you did it seven times in your prime. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, the new you you're always moving towards creativity yeah and so your new creativity has to do with this painting um do you have any pictures of your paintings i'm not sure we have any today mm -hmm. on the slide set uh, uh, the that is a question from d the only thing this is something that i painted to make my new invention you know go on my phone Right. So I had to have a way to uh, to put it on this. So I said, I'll draw it and, and, and make it like what I want it to be so someone could understand. So that's that's a, a piece of art that I did. And, and the background is a, is, a, is a phone. Right, right, to show that it could be on your phone. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Are you um, uh, thinking about... Um, uh, marketing this in a new way or you're still going to be using your sort of word of mouth and personal connection for yeah. marketing your painting work well see that's how it all started i call it word by mouth <laughs> you know <laughs> word by mouth that's how i made it in life it's like you, you tell somebody something or you show somebody something and they tell a person about it and they tell somebody else and before you know it you got a clientele of people I used to call it my army. In other words, a person is that's really like what you do, I make them a lieutenant, you know, so because they're going to tell more person than a private would. So <laughs> a personal army of, of good clients that, um, I mean, you, you end up loving people just like they're your family. They've been with you so long. You know, um, I was just thinking about old Jock. I did his hair when he was uh, in, um, in school. He used to carry oh. his briefcase, you know, and now he's, he, he, Jock got to be in his 60s, you know, but I'm just saying, I just, I just think about people that, that's been with me all that time. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Well, you're a very people person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hooking up with real, you know, uh, people and their stories. Yeah. Um, some other questions we have are, how do you manage your time for Margaret? Yeah. Well, time management, time management is part of my life. You know, um, like I got here, without understanding, there's no action. So you got to understand what you're trying to do before action will kick in. And once you do that, then things begin to come around to you the way you want it to be. And it's really all up to you. Do you have a schedule? Matt? Do you have a schedule? Do you schedule your days? Yeah, yeah you pretty have a much. schedule that you yeah, do pretty daily? Much. 
and, and what write, it is you write it out or you just have it in your mind right out and I, I use a journal you know you write oh. down your daily actions and what you're doing and what you want to happen and before you know it that journal turns into a reality piece that <laughs> makes things happen it really does <laughs> you know? and a lot of these things might sound a little far-fetched but but if you do them long enough and you train your subconscious mind they manifest themselves I don't know if that answered the question, but no, that no, that's very helpful. That's very mm -hmm. helpful, okay. and it's very much your perspective. That's now, it. an anonymous question is: um, since the '60s, mm -hmm. there has been a trend towards natural hair. Yeah. How do you deal with natural hair? Just let it be natural, and just um, give treatments, basically treatments to keep the hair healthy, hair and scalp. You know, people like to wear their hair wild now. They just like to let it do what it do. Some people like it to dread. Some people like it to, um, when you cornrow, stuff like that. So whatever they want, as long as I can add what I do to make it better. So you're not necessarily committed to um, chemicals. If that's what people want. And if that's what they that. want and, and I can do it, I'll do it. But right. I'm going to do it the right way. I'm gonna make sure it's right. That's the key. The proper, the, the proper right. procedures. Yeah. But if they want their hair natural, because the, the afro was mm -hmm. originally a natural hairstyle. Exactly. If you didn't do anything um artificial to it, but you right. might cut it or shape mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You didn't you didn't add chemicals or other uh, nothing that's gonna cause problems. And if they get color in their hair, they must <laughs> have it treated on a regular basis. Some people will put color in their hair and don't do anything. And then that's how the hair breaks off. But you know, you can do that, but you don't, you can do it the right way where that hair will continue to grow and look good. Because basically you're using moisturizers and protein treatments and stuff like that, using a heat cap or a steamer or a dryer, but you do it with a plastic cap on and that way it holds all the moisture in and using the right products, knowing what products to use for the type of hair that you're working on. <clears throat> Another person, their question is a little hard to understand, but I'm gonna attempt it. If, if, okay. if uh, I get it wrong, that person can ask again. Okay. Uh, but they said, um, apparently they had an idea uh, and they wonder if it's worth it to go through your idea and make it manifest um, if if you don't um, make a lot of money, and yeah. uh, I have to say you 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 haven't made a lot of money from your uh, inventions, mm -hmm. um, and you have some thoughts about that that you might yeah. want to talk about that. Well, what what it is is like there's a business part to everything. You can invent something, you can create something, but if you don't have the smarts to make it work in the money field then you got a big problem. So what I have decided to do, I have several products and I want to get a, a, a backer or somebody for all my products at the design, like the apron, the shelf, the um, everything, you know, and just do it like that. But I don't know, I guess it's invention uh, capital or whatever, but I'm not sure of that part. So I would have to do a lot of research and study but there's always somebody that that, that uh, has the answer to that, and that person will come around eventually. Right, right, right. Well, um, another person, Ronnie, asked, "Have you thought about starting a?" Wait a minute, Have you Go thought ahead. about? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Have you thought about starting? I was talking a to Paul. Before. Yes. Have you thought about starting a mentoring program? for young adults on how to be a barber or become an entrepreneur? You know, I did that quite a bit. I worked for um, um, Bennett School of Beauty and at, at the time, they Oh they yes, had, isn't that in Northeast, uh, near the- Yeah, near Monroe the Street, somewhere like yes, that. Yes, it's- Yeah, I, I, worked for, I worked for them for a while, I worked with them a while at the jail. They wanted me to, oh. uh, to go and I went over to the jail and I worked there for a year and a half, the uh, city jail. And you know, teaching the kids over there how to do um, whatever kids, adults, 
how to um, cut hair and so forth. And they had a, a beauty program going at that particular time. And, you know, I, I've done that quite a bit, you know, in, in, in my time, because when I was working with Soft Sheen, they would send you into beauty salons to show the stylists how to use the products properly. Right. My job. So, like I said, I went all over the world doing that. And uh, it was satisfi satisfying, but sometimes you get a little tired doing stuff. And you just, you say, Sometimes you do, yes. So, you know, you say, well, I had enough, you know, and come on out. So in your sort of retirement, because you're not really exactly no. retired, no. you're mm -hmm. still doing your hair, barber mm -hmm. stylist, yes. uh, and now you've taken up art. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you do anything to relax? Uh, pretty much. You know, I, I, I'm always on, on point, what I call on point. That means <laughs> doing what you're supposed to do to make it happen. <laughs> but if you, if you plan your work and work your plan, then things kind of work itself out for you. Yes, That's well, every space in your house that I recently visited mm -hmm. is a workspace. Yes. The living room, the dining room, mm -hmm. the basement, every space that's not uh, sleeping and eating is for work. So yes. you must just go from workspace to workspace to workspace. <laughs> I do sometimes. And that's fun to me because it's different from what I was doing. Well, starting a um, school or participating in a barber school would be, uh, I, I hear some uh, um blips on the, uh, uh, but starting a school or participating in a school, oh, it looks like it's freezing for a while. I'll keep talking in, in case everyone can hear me, um, is a big undertaking. And so you might not be ready to start an entire school. Actually, because we're coming close to the end of our program, uh, we only have about 14, 15 minutes left. Maybe this is a good time for Allison to talk about the archives itself. I hope sure. Allison heard that. I am. Hi, everybody. I'm here. I'm Allison Oswald, and I'm an archivist at the Archive Center at American History. Emma, could you bring up one of the last slides, please? It has some useful information for all of the audience members. Um, it will give you an opportunity to have some information about probably one slide back, please. Um, where you can grab some information about Nat's um, collection. This gives you a little bit of information about who we are and how you can connect with us. As Faith said earlier, um, unfortunately, we're not open to the public, but we really are looking forward to welcoming everybody back once um, it is safe for both the staff and for our visitors uh, to be in our reading room. But we do hold um, a tremendous amount of documentation about invention. And Nat's collection is just one that documents an independent inventor. And we are just um, thrilled to have his stuff that gets used by all sorts of people, um, particularly academics writing books um, and other people who are interested in barbering, um, but really in studying uh, in the invention process and being an independent inventor. Um, there are links here, and I think in the chat, if you can pull that up, I dropped in a direct link to Nat's collection and to the famous Amos collection that Faith had referenced earlier. But you are welcome to send us um, directly email if you'd like to learn more about Nat's collection or about any collection that you find, um, you know, uh, doing a Google search or through our catalog, our online catalog, which I will also drop into the chat for people. You are now. You're back. Okay, good. Okay, that's wonderful. All right, where yes. were we? Hey, yeah, well, we with Allison uh, Oswald talk a little bit about what's at the American History Archives. Okay, and so that's great. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, another question came in. Speaking okay. Of relaxing, are there spots you are still using your studio? for your singing and recording. Do you still do that or you? No, I cut that loose. I only sing in the bathtub now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I gave you one of my recordings, so you got to check yes. it out. Yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to be sure to give that to Allison to add to our reference files about the collection. Okay. Um, that's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, I think I had another chat question here. Let me go to the chat. Um, yes, there are. Uh, uh, one of the things that is very interesting about you is that um, you have these uh, uh, philosophical points of view that are enormously optimistic. Plus also, as Mimi Minnick, who used to work at the archives uh, in the National Museum of American History, she called you a person who had a great serendipity. Yeah. She told me that word, serendipity. Because mm -hmm. serendipity uh, kind of means sort of being in the right place at the right time to meet the right people. And you That's seem it. to have had extraordinarily good luck in mm -hmm. finding mentors and people who would help you. Would you like to talk a little bit about some of those mentors? <clears throat> yes. Um, one of the things that I found is um, you just listen more. And you, that's how you find these people. You know, you listen to their conversations, what they're talking about. And if you, if you have programmed your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind works for you. And it just, you know, makes things happen, but you gotta believe it. And if you've been doing it as long as I have, it just comes. It's something that uh, is just there. And it's up to you to believe that, it's, that you can make it happen. And I think a lot of times with my um, things that I do with the um, programming my mind, it's like I try to be a creator of moments in people's lives. You know that's I think it's very important that you. What, what um, do you make, mean by what do you mean by creating moments in people's lives? In other words, like we're talking now, and sometimes you go, "Oh, okay, I understand." You know, it's like that. That's the moment that you created that made them think about something that they wouldn't have normally thought about. Um, here's a question from Margaret, and that okay. might might be our last question because we have some. Uh, um, housekeeping to just close out the thing, the uh, uh, conversation. But Margaret asks, are you disturbed that kids these days spend so much time on social media and don't yeah. think, don't take time to think as you did as a child? Yeah. See, they're so busy. They make now, you so must busy. have grandchildren. I do. Great grandchildren. And great grandchildren. Okay. Yeah. You, you're very <laughs> blessed. Yeah. Grandchildren and great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times these days they are focused on these machines and stuff and not thinking about what their mind can really do. So even in, in the skating class, I, I relate to that because, you know, I'm with kids all the time showing them how to do things. And you can see the ones that's really got spark in them and the ones that don't really want. I remember telling a girl yesterday. I said, your mother's spending all this money for you to learn how to skate and here you sitting down, you know. Oh, right. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, they make up excuses. Can I go to the bathroom? But you got the ones that just, you know, for that whole hour, they do what you're saying. And that makes a difference. See? So you got to find out who those people are and work with them even more. Right. I mean, you're going to work with the ones that's, you know, underprivileged or whatever. But the thing is, you got to get that spark working in them. And you can see it. I got a little girl. She must be about eight years old, but she is really, I mean, she's going to be something. You can see uh -huh. it. You know, you can see it in them, you know? So I work with them and I work with all of them. I don't let none of them down, but I let them know that they're going to have to move up a little bit instead of <laughs> all, all this foolishness, you know? <laughs> well, well your, your life is a testament mm -hmm. to hard work. Yes, and to, to being uh, keep, keeping up uh, these uh, tenants mm -hmm. that that you use um, uh, that you quote from your grandparents mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, sayings. I noticed some of these sayings you have up in your house. Mm -hmm. uh, one one of my favorites, though, which gets us back to African Americans in their hair is uh, uh, let your hair be my problem. Yes. I, I really I really love that because a lot of African-Americans think of their hair as a problem, particularly women, men mm -hmm. perhaps less so. 
And um, that is a, a beacon of hope yes. that uh, somebody will help you solve mm -hmm. those problems with your hair. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, uh, I it, it, it's interesting to think about whether children today uh, might get the same or similar um, relationships and whether these are mediated by, by online in a way that's very different than mm -hmm. perhaps when you and I were children. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and what I wanted to do also, Faith, I wanted to thank the uh, audience, those that signed up for the um, program. I want to thank them and my family. I know my family are listening and my daughters and all. And I really love you all and I, everybody, even my customers, everybody that, you know, signed in and still believe in me. And I love you so much. And I always say, you're so kind and considerate. Your generosity is simply overwhelming. It's only yes. exceeded by your good looks and such pleasing personality. <laughs> that's, another, that's another one of those statements. That's what I'm um, Only yeah. exceeded by your good luck, looks, and pleasing and personality. personality. That's it. Yes, well, who could resist that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're, we're closing in on the last five minutes of the program. I don't know whether, um, uh, let's see here. Oh, oh, let's make sure that we show. Uh, connect with an archivist. I think we already did that one. Um, yes, online resources. I think you should go to the to the final slides uh, to talk about um, um, you know the Smithsonian generally, but the Museum of American History has a very active a uh, business history collection both at the Archive Center and in a division called Work and Industry for Objects. So we would like to, to, to share with anyone in the audience that if you have a business history story uh, that, that you think might be uh, worthy to be in the museum, you should certainly contact uh, curators at the Archive Center or other curators in um, Work and Industry at the National Museum of American History to uh, talk about whether your collection should be part of the national collections. And you can do that by email. You can start out by doing it by email. Are there any, um, we're coming to the end of our conversation. Um, the Limelson Center for Invention and Innovation is uh, also, uh, a, a repository of uh, materials. The Limelson Center is about 25 years old, so it was just getting started when uh, Mr. Mathis's collection came into the Smithsonian. But we are, the Limelson Center, who Arthur Damrick, who spoke first, um, is uh, the director, and a number of people who are working here work for that center. It's L-E-M-E-L-S-O-N, the Limelson Center, and they do uh, reflect invention that goes from video games to um, uh, uh, boat types to um, uh, surf gliders to all kinds of unusual things, as well as uh, innovation. And the innovation can be in anything, it can be innovation such as the one, the things that Mr. Mathis has done, but it can also be innovation related to uh, creative activity. So the Limelson Center is in partnership with the American History Museum in documenting hip hop and the growth of hip hop, which is an, a musical innovation that started out uh, very small and, um, perhaps um, discouraged by uh, certain forces within the society, but has now become a predominant uh, popular culture uh, genre. It has more than one genre of uh, hip hop. And that's just one example of exhibits that you can see if you come to 
the Museum of American History, which is now open from Friday through Monday. Eventually, we hope to go back to a full schedule, but right now for COVID, we are open Friday through Monday. The Limelson Center, how you reach the Limelson Center is now in the chat. And uh, Mr. Mathis, uh, want to say goodbye. We are, we are, you have one thing, you want one closing thing you want to yeah. say. Yes, I want to say it to my kids and my grandkids. I want to let them know that they have the magic. And I'll show you what I mean. You see this? Can you see that? Uh, okay. Not easily, but okay. Okay. Oh, right. yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to put it in here in my hand. You can see that. I think you can see it. Okay. Then I'll yes, push I can it down, see it. And I'm going to see what happens. <laughs> okay. But okay, guess what? that magic. And, and here's where. Here's where it ended up. Yes. But I, I wanted my kids and grandkids to know that they have the magic and it's up to you. You can mess around if you want to, but you better get set for the old man and the old lady that's coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, Mr. Mathis, I saw that particular magic trick uh -huh. done by Muhammad Ali, yeah. who loved magic tricks and did magic tricks until the end of his life. Yeah, okay. he was one of my buddies, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, so I got pictures tell that of him story. Yeah. So, go on. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. Minutes. I did his hair, and um, he became a friend, and every time he came to D.C., he would holler at me. And uh, I have the pictures to prove it, so I always document everything. So, great man. Great man. So, on that note, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for staying. Thank you, Mr. Mathis, for being featured. And we look forward to your participation in the other Limelson Center uh, talks, which mm -hmm. are coming up once a month for the next four months. Oh, wow. Thanks again. Thank you, Faith, for everything you've done. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take it easy. Bye-bye.